So Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh is one of those books that was really heavily promoted across my social media, same as Gideon the Ninth, and right now I'm batting two for two because this book is amazing. It's part of a duology and the second part also came out earlier this year and I've read both and I'm going to talk about both of them together as one book. And that's because they're both novellas and because they're so short i'm also going to try and keep it as spoiler free as possible because she packs in quite a bit of information and complex plot details um, with very few words and i don't want to give that away because one of the great pleasures of reading these novellas is that just as you think it's going to zig it actually zags now I spoke about the first book in the series which is Silver in the Wood on my bookstagram and I said that I don't usually ooh and ah over book covers but I just had to over this one because it is gorgeous. I mean take a good look at this cover. Look at its stunning amount of detail and how beautiful it looks. I don't have a physical copy, but just as soon as I feel comfortable going into a bookstore or having things delivered to my house, I fully intend to get a physical copy of both The Silver in the Wood and The Drowned Country, both of which have covers by David Curtis. Again, I don't do this very often, but I literally went on Instagram and I found the book designer and I'm gonna link down to his Instagram page below because it is beautiful. These books are basically a modern day adaptation of the green man myth which is um, I mostly associate that with uh, Britain and British folklore but I think it's also rather um, common and it sort of goes back to very pagan traditions in Europe as well. I personally came across the green man myth through Robert Jordan, which is a rather untraditional path, I suppose, but in The Eye of the World, which is the first book of the uh, Wheel of Time series, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that the main characters in that first book are in search of the green man. And Robert Jordan sort of uh, made his own folklore about the green man and how they fit into this particular world that he's created. And to me, like that is the green man myth that I'm most familiar with and the one that I love the most. I mean, I love that entire arc in the first book. But in Britain, for those of you who are familiar with Arthurian fables and legends, um, it's more closely associated with uh, the Green Knight, for example. And there's an entire um, section of literary criticism that talks about the Green Knight and what it means vis-a-vis -vis, you know, Christianity and paganism and fertility rights and so on and so forth in Britain. And it's very interesting, so if you're interested in Arthur and Merlin and that kind of literature, then I highly recommend you check that out. And there's also a brand new film that's coming out with Dave Patel and the trailer is Bananas. And I'm really excited for it, but I don't know when it's going to come out because of the whole, you know, pandemic situation. But that's all right, because we have these novellas, which are amazing and so unexpected. Like I wasn't expecting it to be about what it was. And it's really a testament to what a good writer can do with very few words. So like I said, I bought both of these books on uh, Kindle and I think the first book was a little over 100 pages, 100 Kindle pages, and then the second one is about 150 Kindle pages. So they're teeny tiny, but you go through an entire arc and you discover not just one, but basically 2.5 different worlds. And you have these amazing characters in them as well. So obviously I don't want to go into too much detail because, you know, no spoilers, but um, I will say that the books sort of rely on the relationship between two men. There's Tobias Finch and there is Henry Silver and Henry is, you know, the silver in the wood. And the books sort of chart the relationship between these two men and it goes from like when they meet each other and the circumstances under which they meet each other and how the relationship evolves and grows over the course of these two novellas. The first book is told from Tobias's perspective and it is so wonderful. 
Tobias is basically this big bear of a man and you just love him immediately. He's just this big cuddly bear that can do like really badass shit. And the second book moves to Henry's point of view and at first you're a little bit mm, or at least I was a little bit mm, because Henry is a bit more complicated as a character. He's much younger, he's figuring things out for himself. And there are times when you just want to smack him upside the head and be like, you know, get a grip on yourself. But it really is a coming of age story for Henry and a rebirth story for Tobias. And the way Emily Tesh takes you on their journey and makes you fall in love with them and really tells you who they are as people, you know, they're like these tiny little moments that she writes into the story that within the space of a few sentences or a couple of paragraphs tell you exactly who these people are. Because we live in a time when it is entirely possible for us to read an entire book, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages and not have a real grasp on who these characters are as people. It's just a journey of their actions. You know, they did this and they did that and then they went there and they met this other person and whoa. Whereas with Emily Tash, she's really taking you sort of behind the scenes and she really lets you get to know these people and the fact that she can do that within, you know, taken all together, basically 200 and something pages is amazing. She also has a supporting cast that is absolutely marvelous. So there is Henry's mother, Mrs. Silver, and I'm not going to tell you, you know, who she is or why she's important to the plot. I think that's a bit of surprise that uh, it really took me aback when it happened in the first book and I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed her character. She's a bit of a warship and throughout the two books, there is a um, character of a dryad called Bramble who is perhaps one of the more interesting characters that I have read in fantasy over the past few years. She doesn't get a ton of screen time, so to speak, and she doesn't do a bunch of different things, but she is incredibly integral to the plot and to the lives of both Tobias and Henry. She's a sort of friend, a mentor, a conscience, and she's not even human. I love her. And in the second book, we have Maud, who is perhaps one of the most fun characters that I've come across. This is amazing first meeting between her and Henry because Henry is this very, you know, he has a few uncle tendencies as I like to call it and he's very prim and proper and then he runs into Maud, and she just basically blows him out of the water. And in a way, it sets up a sort of sibling rivalry between Henry and Maud that is hilarious to me. I think one of the things that I really appreciate about these books is that it has a sense of how many words it needs to devote to this particular story. Unlike say a lot of works that have come out in the recent past, and I'm, I'm not going to like really name names, but I feel like there is an emphasis in especially fantasy for people to just turn things into a longer work than is actually warranted. So you have these books that are supposed to be standalones. I mean, the story just needs a standalone, but instead they become trilogies because that's what sells or that is what the industry standard is. Or maybe that's how you build an audience that'll come back to your work. And one of the things that I appreciate about Emily Tash writing this one is that it's a duology. So in a way she is performing to industry standards and building an audience that will come back to her work. But she's also telling the story in about as much space and as many words as the story actually deserves. And what this means is that perhaps the world and the stories and the supporting characters aren't as fleshed out or aren't as stretched out, to be honest, as some that you might find in other books. But that's fine because the thing a lot of people forget is that when an author just sketches in a more general palette, it allows the reader to enter that space and dream those other stories for themselves. 
So Silver in the Wood, even if you don't want to read the duology, then you know you should try Silver in the Wood because it's really short. It's probably on sale somewhere and it's absolutely marvelous. For more videos, please hit the subscribe button.